All right, so, so far, we've, uh, for this section, we talked about the derivative of the six trigonometric functions. And remember what I said last time, I'm gonna start the class by asking you all what are those six derivatives? Well, that would be something that we will have to know soon. What is the derivative of sine of x? Yes, derivative of cosine? Yes. Uh, derivative of, let's do uh, tangent. Uh, yes, and then derivative of, let's say, uh, cosecant. Yeah, derivative of cosecant of x is negative cosecant x cotangent x. Again, I'm, I'll be a little bit lazy and just say negative cosecant cotangent. Just know, again, I mean cosecant, uh, negative cosecant of x cotangent of x. Uh, derivative of cotangent. Yes. Uh, let's see, who did I left? Uh, derivative of secant. All right, and did I forget any one of those because I went in random order? I think oh, so. Okay, so we have our six trig derivatives. We're gonna try to push that and all of our other derivative rules, product rule, quotient rule, power rule, because we are gonna need that later whenever we finish this section today and go on to the next section as well. All right, so let's start off by just jumping straight into this example. Uh, this is example two, part C. Uh, we didn't get to this example yet. We have y is equal to eight tangent of x divided by seven minus six uh, sine of x. And I want the derivative of this function. That is, I don't want dy dx, or if you want, you can also just write y prime, whatever is your personal preference. They both mean the same thing. In the end, just saying the derivative of y. All right, so what rules do you think that we will need in this function if I want the derivative. Yeah, so I heard three things, all of them correct. We're definitely gonna need the quotient rule because I think we can see that there's a quotient here. Uh, we're gonna need the derivative of tangent and we're gonna need the derivative of sine. So first off, I'm gonna go ahead and write this on the side. I know for quotient rule, usually we need the high and the low. The good thing for quotient rule is that it's pretty straightforward to say what is the high and what is the low. What's my high? Yeah, eight tangent of x, my low. Yeah, remember whenever we're doing quotient rule, high and low, I'm quite literally mean what's on top, what's on the bottom. All right, and then now it would be useful if I go ahead and do the derivative of the high, derivative of the low. So what's the derivative of my high? Let's start off with this. First off, I know the eight is gonna stay there because it's just a coefficient. It's gonna go along. What's the derivative of tangent? Yeah, so derivative of tangent, we should get secant squared of x. And in other words, we get eight secant squared of x for my d high. So I'm just taking the derivative of what's on the left. All right, next, derivative of the low. What's the derivative of seven? Uh, yeah, there will be a cosine in my final one, but uh, going down the line, start off derivative of seven. What's the derivative of a constant? Zero. Remember, if there is no variable involved, it's a constant. The derivative of a constant is zero. Because remember, we know what a constant function looks like. It's a flat line. So derivative of seven is zero. Next, I have negative six. What's the derivative of sine? Yeah, cosine of x. Therefore, the derivative of seven minus six uh, sine of x is negative six cosine of x. 
So here I have my high, my D high, my low, D low. Now I need to apply my quotient rule, which as a reminder was saying the derivatives was low D high minus high D low all over low squared. Or if you prefer instead of high and low, you could have said F and G and F prime and G prime respectively. So applying that quotient rule, I just write down my low seven minus six sine of X, my D high, which was eight secant squared of X minus, when I need to erase this, what's my high again? And my eight tangent of X times the D low negative six cosine of X. Notice that I'm using parentheses here so I don't mix it up as saying tangent minus six cosine. It's tangent times negative six. So low D high minus high D low all over the low write that a little bit clearer. Low in parentheses squared. And then we have our derivative. Granted, unsimplified, but again, I'm sure that uh, I'm pretty confident that you would be fine if I said you don't have to simplify that expression. I guess you technically y'all could, but there wouldn't be much help for the trig functions. So this entire thing, oops, that's not how far I want to go. This whole thing is my answer. Again, we broke it down into what's the high, the low, and then the d high, d low, respectively. And then we just fit in the pieces as we need it. Um, so any questions about how we complete this example two, part C? You can if you want, but right now I'm more concerned about can you do the calculus part? Because the simplification is more of an algebra skill. There will be later where I might ask you to simplify or something like that. But generally, if it's something like this, this is perfectly fine for me. If you want to do some quick simplification, like if you ever get zero times something, yeah, you can clean it up right away. But if it's something like this where it doesn't look like there's going to be a very obvious simplification, then I'm fine with you leaving it in this way. All right, so this was example two, part C, application of trig derivatives with a quotient rule. Let's go ahead and see the next one. Oops. All right, so here's gonna be a challenge problem. Find dr d theta, given that r is equal to three theta sine of theta divided by three plus cosine of theta. So first off, even though I'm using different letters, this is just saying find the derivative of r. So looking at this again, what rules do you think are gonna be applied here? Yeah, we definitely have a quotient rule because I can quite easily see that there's gonna be a fraction. What other rules might be useful? There's a sine derivative, there's a cosine derivative. There's one more rule that we will definitely need to point out. Yeah, there's also a product rule in here. So we got a product quotient with a trig derivative deal. Because we can see here on top, there's a product. Three theta, sine of theta. So I think looking at this overall, I can imagine that this is just one big quotient, right? One thing divided by another. So to start this off, let me go ahead and write this as a quotient rule deal. So what is my high? And what is my low? So starting with the high. Yeah, three theta sine of theta. 
And then my low should be whatever is on the bottom. Three plus cosine of theta. All right, so we have this so far. And I know that eventually I want my D high and D low. Let's start with the easier one, the D low. What's the derivative of a three plus cosine of theta? First off, what's the derivative of three? Zero. What's the derivative of cosine? Yeah, so we have zero minus sine of theta or just negative sine of theta, like what we have here. All right, so that's great. Now let's do the one that's a little bit tougher, the D high. Tell me what that, what you were saying, three theta. Anything else? What rule do I have to use to get the derivative of my high? Yeah, so I know that this is a product, right, in my high. So if I want the derivative of this, I need the product rule, which is, what's the product rule? Someone remind me. You can say in terms of the F and G, or you can say the first, second deal. Yes, first d second plus second d first. So here we already have a good start. We have the first derivative of the second. So derivative of sine is cosine plus, how do I finish up this derivative? What's the second? My, uh, just, well, just my second. Yeah. And then my d first. What's the derivative of the first term I underline? Three. Because derivative of three theta is three. All right. So I know overall I was doing the quotient rule. And now I'm just filling in the blanks for my final answer. So the derivative dr d theta, as a quick note, remember what this notation means. This is the derivative of r, which is given in respect to thetas. So quotient rule states the derivative of a quotient is the low times, what am I going to multiply this by? Which one of these four? So I have, yeah, D high. So low, D high. Let me write this D high first. Low D high minus, yes, minus the high. What's the D low? Here we have negative sine of theta. All over low squared. And then we have our huge derivative. dr d theta is equal to three plus cosine of theta times three theta cosine of theta plus three sine of theta minus three theta sine of theta times negative sine of theta all over three plus cosine of theta squared. So a nice derivative, quote unquote. So we have this entire derivative from here. Let's go ahead and to our, um, I believe I have an example four and then we'll move on to the next section. Let me see what this example four looks like first. Um, second derivative of this function. Uh, yeah, we can go ahead and do this one. What does it mean to take the second derivative again? So, uh, which said the, der the second derivative, remember, is the derivative of the derivative. In other words, I take the derivative two times in a row. 
So if this is my y is equal to seven tangent of t, to get the second derivative, I need the first derivative, which I'm going to use a notation dy dt. So what is the derivative of this function, seven tangent of t? First off, does my seven stay there? Yes, because it's a coefficient. Remember, is it a variable or is it a coefficient? If it's a variable, we're going to have to rely on product rule and stuff like that. But if it's a coefficient, it's just going along for the process. So what's the derivative of tangent then? Derivative of tangent, we know that to be Yeah, we have secant squared of t. So this is why I mean that it's important that we actually get those six trig derivatives because I'm going to be throwing out questions like these real quick. And then we'll be like, all right, what's the derivative of tangent? All right, so this is great. We're done with the first part. We got the first derivative. So looking at this, would you agree that this first derivative, that's the same thing as if I wrote seven secant of t times secant of t. Is that still the same thing? Is it true that secant times secant is secant squared? Yes. Why did I want to write this this way? Yes, because I know I want to take the derivative again. And right now, we don't know how to take the derivative of secant squared. We will after today. So now I claim that we're ready for the second derivative, d2y dt squared. So if I want the derivative of this expression, what one big rule are we going to be using? Product. And then why are we using the product rule? Yeah, we have two things being multiplied. So. For a product rule, we can all call this one our first, and then this one my second. So product rule, we know that. We said it earlier, it's first d second plus second d first. So according to my product rule, I have the first. So this is my first times d second. What's the derivative of my second? Or in this case, the derivative of a secant of t. Again, one of those six trig derivatives. So we know, yeah, so all of y'all, secant of t, tangent of t. Derivative of secant is secant tangent, with the t's included, of course, plus the second. So I just copy down my second, secant of t, times the derivative of the first. So derivative of seven secant of t. First off, my seven stays because it's a coefficient. What's the derivative of secant again? Yeah, secant of t, tangent of t. I'm running out of space here. So this is my first d second plus second d first, giving me my second derivative. So this entire line is what I would call my second derivative. All right, so any individual questions about any of the steps I use to get from one to another? All right, so, so far we've done product rule. We've done a quotient rule. We've done the derivative of trig functions. We've done power rule. We've done the derivative of e to the x. 
So, so far we've done five derivative rules. Now we will move on to number six. Probably in this unit, we're gonna learn total like six, seven, eight, maybe eight or nine derivative rules. The whole point of this is that we're getting learning how to take a derivative of pretty much any function that we can encounter. All right, so let's go into our next section and learn our sixth derivative rule. So this one, as I was mentioning earlier, was not the lecture that you wanted to miss because it involves a lot of derivative layering that we're going through here. So the sixth derivative rule that we will learn about is gonna be called the chain rule. Uh, let's see the slide show. So the chain rule. So based off all the derivative rules that we've worked so far, what is sort of a weakness or an example of something that we can't take the derivative of yet? Something squared, right? Like if I had sine squared of x, I could split it up into product rule and then do a, uh, split it into a product and do a product rule. But then that's a little bit tedious. Imagine if it was sine to the 80th power. I'm pretty sure you don't wanna do product rule 80 times in a row just to get the first derivative. So you're along the right idea of what's gonna end up happening. So for these first two slides, it's gonna be a little bit technical. If you're having trouble understanding these first two slides, do not, don't think too far into it. I'm gonna show you the formal method and then we're gonna talk about what I'm gonna just call my, what I call the onion method. Because what we're gonna do is that we're gonna be peeling layers of the function off one by one as we go through it. All right, so the chain rule allows us to deal with layered functions, things that are more complicated than just uh, sine of x, for example. We can have sine of 28x plus 3, 28x plus 3 on the inside, for example. So here's our theorem. I'm gonna give you two versions of the theorem. Let y be, and this is what was from the textbook as well. You're gonna hear me say f of u a lot. Uh, let y equal f of u be differentiable at u, and u be equal to g of x be differentiable at x. Consider this composition of functions f of g of x. Long story short, what this setup is saying is that if I have a layered function, if I have a function inside a function, this is just the formal setup that I have here. So whenever I talk about a layered function, just so that you're familiar about what I'm gonna mean, is if I had something like, um, x minus seven to the 18th power, so this is an example of a fit function that's more layered. I have this outer layer of the 18 power and an inner layer of x minus seven. So if I have some type of layered function, that is a function composition, and we could have more than one layer, we can have as many layers as needed. Then if I wanna take the derivative of that function, then as I said, there'll be two versions that I will discuss. Again, these are the formal texts, and then we'll talk about how do I think about this informally. The first version is that the derivative of the function is the derivative of the outer layer times the derivative of the inner layer. Again, I'll have to say, just hold on, for, uh, bear with me for a moment as I go through these. And then version B is if I have the derivative of this layered function, again, it's the derivative of the outer times the derivative of the inner. Two different notations, but they actually tell me the same thing. The derivative of the outer layer, derivative of the inner layer. 
And this just varies depending on which notation you prefer. dy dx is equal to dy du times du dx, or the derivative d dx of f of g of x is equal to f prime g of x times g prime of x. So the reason I said don't worry too much about the slides that we're not really going to be using this idea per se in the strict manner. We're not going to be saying, all right, what's y, what's u, what's the derivative of u, what's the derivative of uh, y in respect to u. You could if you want. So we have this chain rule. And again, this allows us to deal with layered functions. I'll give everyone a moment to copy this slide down. And what we're going to actually do is I'm going to jump straight into an example to see how do we apply this chain rule. All right, so let's go ahead into this example. I'm going to skip this slide. This one's just an uh, order. Don't worry about that one. Move. There we go. Let's jump into this example and see what is this chain rule going to say and why did I call it the onion method? I don't think books really call it the onion method, but I call it the onion method. So in this example, determine the derivative of 3 plus 7, in parentheses, all squared. So before, in the previous lectures, what did I have to do? What would I usually have to do if I wanted the derivative of this? And so if I look, yeah, I would have to use product rule. I would say square, same thing as saying 3x plus 7 times 3x plus 7. And then I had to do first, d second, plus second, d first, all that stuff. But for the chain rule, we're going to take the derivative of each layer individually. So if I look at this, what's happening overall? What do you think is considered this outer layer of this function? A little bit quite literally looking at this. Not something separated, but if I look at this and I think about the layers of this function, to start us off, I'm going to say the outer layer of this function is just something squared, right? In the end, it is something squared. So what I'm writing here will be a little bit informal. If I think, if I just want to list this outer layer, it looks like something squared. Again, we're being a little bit abstract here. What would be my inner layer? Yeah, whatever is inside that square, right? The 3x plus 7. Inner layer, which I'm going to call this 3x plus 7. So I had this outer layer, or you can call it the overall behavior of this function, if you want to call it that way, and then my inner layer. So how does the chain rule apply for us here? Well, first off, I know I'm using chain rule because there's multiple layers to this function. I have two layers. So here's what I meant by the onion method. The onion method is, is the idea that we take the derivative of each layer until we get to the innermost. So if I look at this, something squared, this is the same idea as if I had something like x squared, right? What would be the derivative of x squared? Yeah, so derivative of x squared, we would use power rule, right? We'd bring down a 2 and get 2x. I'm going to do the same thing here for my outer layer, but with a slight change. I would bring down to 2 and then reduce the power down by 1. This is the outer layer derivative. I'm going to fill in this blank in a second. Derivative. So 
I'm going to ask you a question here. So before derivative of x squared was 2x, what do you think the derivative of this outer layer, what, what do you think should go into this layer? 3x plus seven. I'm not done with the derivative, but this is the derivative of the outer layer. I finished the derivative of the outer layer, which was just a power rule. And then I move on to the next layer. What is the derivative of my inner layer? What's the derivative of this? Yeah, three. This is my inner layer derivative. 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 That's how you spell it. So again, my outer layer looked like something squared. So I can think of x squared and say, well, that derivative is usually power of rule. I moved on to the second layer, which is 3x, and took its derivative, which we know derivative of 3x plus 7, we get 3. Do I have any more layers left in this function? No. Once I run out of layers, then there's, I finish the derivative. We're going to do a lot of practice with this particular rule. But here is my derivative. 2 times 3x plus 7 times 3. We took the derivative of each layer as I go closer to the inner layer. All right, so this is example one. Let's go ahead and look at example two and see if we can apply that same concept. So clearing the screen. What if I have cosine to the 12th power of x? I definitely would not want to do product rule with this. So to help me figure out my layers, remember that cosine to the 12th power of x? Before I even do the derivative, that's the same thing as me writing cosine of x to the 12th power, right? That's still the same thing. So the reason I wrote it in this way is that it's a little bit easier to see what's the layer of each function. So if I want the derivative dy dx, if you want, you can write this on the side. Let's write my outer layer and then my inner layer. So overall, what do you think is the outer layer of this function? Yeah, this power of 12, right? Something to the 12th power. Again, writing this a little informally, but we have something to the 12th power. What about my inner layer? Cosine of x. And do I really have any other layers beyond that? No, not really. It could be possible, but then we know cosine of x. That looks like a standard function. All right, so I have my layers listed out. Let's go ahead and take the derivative. Chain rule says basically I'm taking the derivative of each layer until I reach the last one. So what's the derivative of something to the 12th power? 12 times that something to the 11th power, because we know power rule, right? But this isn't just x to the 12th power, it's cosine. So I'm going to put cosine, oops, how that happened? Cosine of x. This is my outer layer derivative. Again, this is because we don't just have x to the 12th. Usually we would say that that's 12x to the 11th is because it is a cosine of x to the 12th power. All right, so I finished layer one. What about my derivative of the inner layer? What should I write next? The inner derivative. Yeah, derivative of cosine, we know it's negative sine. Do I have any other layers beyond cosine? No, so I know that I'm done. Again, we keep on going until we finish all of our layers of the function. And a lot of times it's going from the outer layer to the inner layer.
Well, the reason that we stop here is that we don't have any layers beyond cosine of x. If there was a third layer, then we would keep on going. And we will talk about what happens whenever we have a third layer, fourth layer, fifth layer. What if we have a seven layered function? Well, if I have seven layers to my function, that means I take seven derivatives down uh, in a row. Here I had two layers, so I took two derivatives in a row. So the derivative of cosine to the 12th power of x is 12 cosine of x to the 11th power times negative sine of x. Notice that I did not use any product rule here. Before, if I try to do this through product rule, I've had to do product rule at least 12 times in a row, which you can imagine is not the funnest thing to do. All right, so what I have there is my solution. And just to make it clear, it's what I have here. Another reason why I'm not asking you to simplify, I really want you to see where each layer of my derivative came from. All right, so we have example two. Still gonna give you some time to write this down. But so far we've been fortunate to only have two layers. Now the things that we can do to expand this. So if you were me, how would you make this more complicated? Yeah, that'll be a little complicated, but doable as we just go through the layers. So let's see what I have next in store for y'all, because I don't remember what I put next also. Oh, nice, this one. What better way to introduce the chain rule than to combine a chain rule with trig and then a product rule? So first off, I've already said this a little preemptively, but can we see here that I have a product? I have one expression times another expression. In this case, if I'm using product rule, what should probably be my first? Yeah, let's call this my first. Now I'll just write that on the side for our use. First, let's let that be sine of 3x. That leaves my second to be what? All right, so, so far it looks like standard product rule, identifying the first and the second. I know in product rule, I need the derivative of the first and the derivative of the second at some point. So, Let's look at my D first. So if I want the derivative of sine of 3x, my first question is, will I need the chain rule for the derivative of sine of 3x? Do we automatically know what the derivative of sine of 3x is without any rules? We know the derivative of sine of x but we don't automatically know the derivative of sine of 3x. In other words, sine of 3x, this is a layered function. Uh, you're very close. So if I look at sine of 3x, we're focusing on a d first, what is the outer layer? Sign, right? Sign of something. What's the inner layer? Mm -hmm. So by chain rule, I take the derivative of each layer. So what's the derivative of my outer layer? Cosine of 3x. And what's the derivative of my inner layer? Yeah, so the derivative of 3x. Yeah, we should just get 3. So this is the derivative of the outer layer for sine. And then three comes from the derivative of the inner layer. 
close that parentheses. And then clearly I have no other layers beyond 3x. What about this d second? First off, what would be the derivative of the outer layer of this function? Yeah, eight plus this to the seventh power. Because overall this outer layer is something to the eighth, right? That's the outer layer. So I have the derivative of the outer layer. What's the derivative of the inner layer? Yeah, so three, because derivative of three x plus seven, my inner layer is three. All right, so I've done all the hard work here. I got first, I got second, I got d first, and I got d second. So now I can apply my nice product rule, quote unquote nice, dy dx which is the first. So I copy down the first times d second. d second, if you want, you can clean this up a little bit or you can leave it alone. This one, I'm just gonna clean up real quick because three times eight, we can do 24 very quickly. So 24 times three x plus seven to the seventh power. So this is first, d second, plus, what's the next thing I should write down? Yeah, my second, which is just 3x plus 7 to the eighth power. And then we need d first, which is this over here. Just for convenience, I'm just going to move that 3 to the front because cosine times three is three cosine, for example, just to save me a, a set of parentheses. So we have a chain rule, uh, a product rule with two embedded chain rules. So the next problem I'm going to do is not something I'm going to ever give you because it's going to be a very long derivative. I'm going to just show work this out myself and show you how a chain rule can get out of hand very quickly. But first, I'll let y'all copy this down. So the fact is that for a chain rule, I think we're going to be spending probably three days for this whole week on it, just so that we can get a lot of practice on this chain rule. Because this is the chain rule is where a lot of people tend to stumble here and there, because there's a lot of things moving around. All right, so as I said, this next problem that I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna skip a couple slides. This is not a problem that I would probably give you on an exam because it's gonna be overly complicated, but I'll show you how it goes. Let me move this over if I had some monster like this. So I'm just gonna show you what the solution would look like. Uh, I'm not gonna actually talk about it, just to show you how long the derivative actually turns out to be. Uh, rem yeah, remember how a couple of days ago or like last week or a week before, I said I ran out of room on the board? It would be for a problem like this. dy dx, I'll write x for small too. All uh, right, 3x plus 1, 3 fifth power long to pi. Behind, we have 5, 4, 6, and second, uh, we have 2 second of x cubed times, oh, that's not what I wanted. Yeah, not what that is. Uh, two sigma this, secant, 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 tangent, times 3x squared, first and second, 
plus secret squared x cubed. Uh, second order of sine is cosine or x. Uh, the second is, yeah, sine, root of sine is cosine, 4x four is 4. Uh, first, the second, this, uh, low d high, minus sine of 4x, secant squared of x cubed, low d high minus, uh, what, derivative of low, 3, x plus 1, uh, Three fifth to the negative two fifth times three. All over three x plus one to the three fifth. Squared. If you can do this one, then I would give you an A for the exam too. A problem like this. This would be something I would definitely give if I. This would not be a. This would be a problem if I gave to like an accelerated honors calculus one. Is it doable? Yes. Is it fun for y'all? More than likely not. I would be willing to guess. Low d high with it. It is a product rule with an embedded. Is a quotient rule with an embedded product rule with a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven chain rules in, involved in there somewhere. So as you can see, I ran out of room on this board to go all the way across, but in the end, it is product rule with quotient rule with several chain rules involved. I might've made a mistake because I was going real quick through this, uh, but you can see why this is an example of something I would not give for y'all on an exam. For any reason. Um, we're mainly going to be working with what I'm going to call the quote unquote simpler chain rule ones, where we don't have a chain rule involved with a product rule and uh, everything like that. All right, so uh, the next thing I want to mention real quick is I'm thinking that we'll do chain rule for most of this week. So we have two options about what's going to happen after chain rule. We can either, I'll give you all two options and then y'all can decide which one would y'all prefer to go from here. So option one is we continue doing a little bit more on derivative rules, or we take a short detour to an application of the derivative. Because I think the next one is implicit differentiation, which we will learn sooner or later. So it's either implicit differentiation in logarithms, or we can do a little bit of physics application. So out of those two, which one would you prefer to happen first? Because we're gonna do both of them eventually. So would you rather do some physics and economics applications, or would we rather do the more derivative rules? I will say that of this unit, usually the chain rule is what's the toughest subject for the entire unit, as you can probably tell from here. Um, for now, uh, we'll figure it out after we go through all of chain rule. If it takes us one day or like uh, two days, we should definitely be able to finish it this week because we're just gonna be doing extra practice and stuff like that. I think what will happen probably on Thursday is that I'll be giving each of y'all a problem and then for y'all to work in groups or something to try to figure out what the solution is for that chain rule problem. Maybe I'll give you something like a six layered chain rule. Yeah, it'll be, it sounds like a lot of work, but it'll actually be a lot nicer than what I have here. It will be like sine of cosine of tangent of sine of something. All right, so that's all for today. Um, I'll see y'all tomorrow. Um, I did post a homework assignment. It mainly, most of it covers what we did last week. And then there is, uh, there is some stuff that we covered today from chain rule, but none, nothing about chain rule of product rule and quotient rule. It was like the one where we had the outer and the inner function, like a two-layered function.
All right. So besides that, I'll see you all tomorrow on Tuesday.